The Tang Dynasty, which was established between 617 and 621 by the Li family, taking over from uh, the Sui Dynasty, which had preceded it, really comes into its own under the reign of the second emperor, uh, Li Shimin. Li Shimin, as we talked about last time, had been in some ways the motive force behind the establishment of the Tang. It was he who had urged his father, Li Yuan, to rise up in 617 in rebellion against the Sui. Um, and it was Li Shimin who really had the, the greater vision, I think, of, of what the new dynasty, what the new order was that he wanted to uh, preside over. So in 626, when Li Yuan abdicated the throne and Li Shimin became the second emperor of the Tang, uh, it was really um, sort of a second beginning, a second establishment of the dynasty. And Li Shimin proved to be a very energetic and very competent ruler. He took over, uh, continued many of the institutional practices that had been developed under the Sui dynasty. Uh, the Sui had succeeded in reintegrating China, reestablishing a unified dynasty after three centuries of division, and had come up with a number of institutional innovations that were uh, quite useful in stabilizing and, and developing the economy, establishing military control, and uh, creating a more uh, effective and efficient government. Uh, Li Shimin continues these practices. Uh, one uh, uh, consolidation, I suppose you could say, institutionally that he presides over, uh, fixes the number of ministries, the number of, of uh, leading institutions in the central government at, at six. And the system of six ministries, which had begun to emerge under the sway, uh, once it is uh, formalized in the Tang, remains the basic institutional structure of the imperial administration all the way down to 1911. Uh, when the imperial age, the last dynasty, uh, collapses. Li Shimin also uh, begins the practice of having a separate uh, bureaucratic institution to manage the affairs of the imperial household, uh, sort of creating a division between the, the personal finances, the personal activities of the emperor and the imperial family, and the affairs of the government. Uh, and this is, it's an important development because it makes governmental finance and the operations of the state uh, more manageable, more discreet, uh, not, as, uh, uh, not as intermingled with the, the particular activities of the ruler. So there's not as much opportunity uh, for, uh, for uh, simple indulgence and abuse. It, it creates a more bureaucratic structure to manage both public affairs and the the private affairs of the emperor, which are not really all that private, but are separate from, uh, from the activities of government. Li Shimin also continued the military campaigns which had been begun under the sway, the efforts to uh, extend Chinese power into Korea, uh, into uh, Southeast Asia, uh, bringing Vietnam back into uh, direct Chinese control, uh, and most significantly, out in the far west. Uh, indeed, under Li Shimin and his next couple of successors, Tang armies uh, project Chinese power much further west than had ever been the case before. They establish direct Chinese control, the, the uh, operation of the imperial administrative system out into uh, what is now Xinjiang province in far western China to uh, cities like Hami. Uh, and even beyond that, far beyond that, out into what is now parts of uh, Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan and even Afghanistan, uh, local rulers accepted the overlordship of the Chinese emperor and a series of, of protectorates were established where Chinese travelers and merchants could, uh, could go freely uh, and in, in safety and security. And this helped to contribute to the great economic expansion uh, of the Tang dynasty. The capital of uh, the Tang uh, was the city of Chang'an, uh, a city that we're familiar with by now as having been a political center under the Han, uh, under the Qin, uh, even under the Zhou. It was uh, the, uh, the capital, it was the site of successive dynastic capitals, and once again, the Tang established their principal capital there. They also continued to use the city of Luoyang further east as a secondary capital, uh, and at certain times the emperor uh, is in residence there.
but Chang'an is the main center. Uh, it is in some ways the terminus or the starting point of the Great Silk Road, the long overland trade route that connects China with India, Persia, the Eastern Mediterranean. And both through overland trade coming from uh, 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 inner Asia into China and from maritime trade coming around through Southeast Asia from the Indian Ocean, from uh, the South China Sea, uh, and in from Korea and Japan. Trade routes from all over East Asia, South Asia, Southeast Asia, and, and Western Asia converge at Chang'an, and it becomes probably the greatest city in the world up to that time. A population of two million people, uh, it, it was vastly larger than its nearest rivals, which would have been Baghdad and Cairo at this time. Um, and it was a city in the streets of which you could encounter people from civilizations all across Eurasia. Uh, it became a cosmopolitan center that was uh, unrivaled and probably unprecedented at that time. Economic growth uh, fueled in part by this vast international trading system, but also simply by the peace and prosperity that, the, uh, that a stable dynasty brought to China, to a unified and integrated China. Uh, economic growth was, was quite rapid uh, in the uh, first century of the Tang. And demographic growth as well. The population expanded uh, considerably during this time. Uh, the population growth was in part um, a result of territorial acquisitions, the expansion of the, uh, the realm, the growth of the territory directly controlled by the Chinese, but largely a result of, of domestic uh, uh, natural increase. Uh, the lack of internal uh, warfare uh, meant that people had uh, a greater probability of surviving, and the prosperity, the, the growth in agriculture, the growth in the circulation of commodities, uh, raised the standard of living for people, and that too contributed to both um, longer life expectancy and to a greater willingness to bring children into the world and a greater probability that those children would survive. So a number of factors come together uh, to yield a significant expansion uh, in population during this time. In the course of the Tang Dynasty, the population of China goes from perhaps 120 million people up to perhaps 250 or some estimates even go as high as 300 million people at its peak. Uh, by far the largest uh, empire uh, the largest country uh, uh, in the world. The social order in the Tang Dynasty is a continuation of the aristocratic system which had emerged back during the Han. Uh, the basis of, uh, of uh, wealth and status being the ownership of uh, large estates, uh, great families which had uh, now, many of them, uh, been in place, uh, been in possession of these estates for hundreds of years. Uh, the Tang sets about formalizing and regularizing this uh, to an extent even greater than what we've seen previously. Indeed, the Tang establish at the capital uh, a registry, uh, of a sort of genealogical registry that maintains uh, a, a list of the great families um, and maintains genealogical records showing you know, who's, who's a member of the great families. Um, and it is from these great families that uh, officials in the imperial government tend to be recruited. If your family was uh, uh, recognized as uh, one of the clans uh, uh, recorded in the registry, then you were considered sort of automatically eligible, if you were otherwise qualified, for recruitment into government administration. If you were not from this elite strata, it would have been very, very difficult for an individual to enter into uh, public service, public life, to be employed in the imperial administration. And there are some very practical reasons why this should have been the case. It's, on the one hand, it's a matter of aristocratic privilege, but there are also some practical elements that make this somewhat reasonable, most notably being that in order to attain the kind of education, the mastery of the textual tradition, uh, the writings of Confucius, the histories of China, uh, the body of precedent and, and uh, uh, and historical knowledge that was necessary uh, to function as a member of the literate elite culture, 
you needed a certain amount of economic resources. An ordinary peasant family, a family that had to deploy all the available labor resources at its command simply in the production of food, uh, wouldn't be able to spare a young man for the many years of study that would be necessary to achieve the kind of learning uh, that was requisite for employment by the state. So the elite families, by virtue of their control of agricultural wealth, also had the resources to support the educational undertaking of preparing young men to serve in the government. Um, Leishman's reign uh, lasts down to 649. He uh, uh, passes the throne on to uh, his son and, and a, the, a, a series of, uh, of descendants uh, follow him on the throne. But in 690, a very interesting development takes place, a completely unprecedented event uh, in Chinese history. And this is the assumption of imperial power by a woman. Uh, never before in Chinese history uh, has there been a woman emperor. But in 690, a woman named Wu Zetian uh, assumes the throne. And she is a unique figure. Never again will a woman uh, reign in her own name. Never again will a woman be the emperor of China. In Chinese, uh, uh, Chinese is not a gendered language, so the term for the ruler, Huangdi, is not uh, gender specific. It doesn't mean emperor as opposed to empress, the way that we have in, uh, in English. Uh, so uh, when Wu Zetian was on the throne, she was Huangdi. She, was, she had the same title as an emperor would have had. So she reigned in exactly the same way that a man would have. She gets to do this. She arrives at this uh, very unique uh, uh, situation by having started out uh, at a very young age, perhaps 12 or 13 years old, uh, as a consort, a concubine uh, of Li Shermin. She comes into the imperial harem during uh, the last year of Li Shermin's life. It's not even clear that he ever actually would have met her or encountered her. Uh, when the emperor died, as was the traditional practice, all the women of his court, all the, the consorts that he had, um, were retired into nunneries, into Buddhist nunneries. Uh, and because it was felt uh, that it would be inappropriate for a woman who had been the partner of an emperor to then become uh, the partner of anybody else, even his successor. So uh, all the women, all the court ladies were retired into uh, nunneries. On the first anniversary of Li Shermin's death, however, his successor, his son, uh, visited the former court ladies and was totally captivated when he saw Wu Zetian. Now, she would still only have been perhaps 15 years old at this point, um, and he fell in love with her. And he contrived then, of course, he was the emperor, so he could do this sort of thing, to bring her back to the palace. And over the next few years, he makes her his favorite, and eventually he displaces his actual empress, his wife. Uh, he casts her aside and makes Wu Zetian the empress. So this is how she gets to direct proximity to the throne. Now, as it happens, uh, he doesn't have sons who inherit the throne, but rather nephews who inherit the throne. So Wu Zetian does not become the mother of the next emperor, uh, but she is the aunt of the next emperor, and indeed the next two emperors are both nephews of hers. And in 690, she sets aside her nephew, who is a, a very young boy and, and not a very competent individual at that, uh, and she assumes imperial power herself. She reigns for 15 years. Formally, she changes the name of the dynasty. She calls her dynasty the Zhou dynasty, echoing all the way back uh, to, to ancient times. Um, and in 705, after 15 years on the throne, she steps down. She abdicates the throne, and a member of the Li family, actually one of the nephews that had uh, reigned prior to her, returns to the throne very briefly for just a few years. Uh, and then uh, uh, Wu Zetian dies uh, of natural causes. She, uh, she's not assassinated or murdered or anything like that. And this brings this, this episode to a conclusion. Now, the reign of Wu Zetian is a very unique moment. 
And if one reads the traditional Chinese historiography about this, uh, it's, it's a pretty bleak story. Uh, the Confucian gentlemen who wrote the stories down uh, didn't like this. They thought it was completely inappropriate uh, for a woman to have this kind of power. Uh, and so they did everything they could to blacken her reputation. But if one looks instead of at the, the sort of direct discourse about her, and instead looks at the records of these 15 years, what one sees is that she perhaps was not the greatest ruler in Chinese history, but she was far from the worst. She presided over a period of stability, of economic prosperity. She didn't initiate policies which caused particular problems. She was not a great innovator uh, either. She was uh, a, a ruler like many others. Uh, with the sole difference of having been a woman. But her reputation, or the way, the, the, the position that she holds in the official Confucian historiography, remains very negative. And uh, this is largely, I think, an artifact of um, who gets to tell the story rather than an accurate reflection of uh, the kind of, of uh, rule that she uh, carried out. She was noted for a couple of things, and, and she's been noted, her reign has been noted historically for a couple of phenomena. One was her patronage of Buddhism. This is not unique. Uh, the Li family itself had, uh, had been great patrons of Buddhism. Uh, but uh, Wu Zetian seems to have been very strongly influenced by her spiritual advisors. And of course, there are all sorts of uh, scurrilous stories about her relationships with uh, the monks who were her advisors, and they were supposedly inappropriate in various ways. We don't know to what extent that may be true, or to what extent that too is an artifact of Confucian historiography. More significantly, perhaps, it's clear that in attempting to consolidate her own position, to strengthen her position vis-a-vis -vis the Confucian bureaucracy, who she knew distrusted her, that she consciously undertook to recruit individuals into government service who came from less significant families. She didn't go out and, and recruit farmers out of the fields, but she appealed to, she turned to parts of the aristocracy which had not been the traditional uh, uh, center, the traditional core area for recruitment into government. She went to, to minor families, to families from more remote parts of China, and brought in individuals who were certainly well-educated, competent individuals, but who were not beholden to the established interests at the capital. And in this way, she was able to surround herself with at least some officials who were more directly responsive to her will. This was a very clever political maneuver on her part, and it indicates that uh, she was uh, far more than just a, a sort of opportunist, uh, but had a very, very clear sense of how to work with uh, the institutional structures of the Tang. Well, after her abdication, uh, uh, there's a few years of, uh, of uh, brief reigns until the year 713, when uh, another emperor comes to the throne, an emperor that we know as Xuanzong. And Xuanzong reigns uh, until the year 756, so he has a nice long time on the throne. And he's one of the great emperors uh, in Chinese history. He presides, it's, it's more a matter of the era over which he presides than any particular thing that he does as emperor, but he is uh, fortunate enough uh, uh, to be the emperor of China during perhaps the peak period of the Tang Dynasty, a time when the economy continued to flourish, when uh, the, the role of Chang'an as a cosmopolitan center continued to be uh, quite significant when Buddhist culture flourished, uh, great monasteries were built, uh, uh, great translation projects to further adapt uh, Buddhist scriptures to the Chinese language, to, to further embed Buddhism in Chinese civilization and culture took place. Um, and when Chinese culture itself achieved one of the, one of the truly great moments, um, particularly in, in literature and poetry. Uh, the first part uh, of the 8th century uh, is an age when some of the greatest poets in all of Chinese history uh, lived all at the same time. They knew each other, they wrote in response to each other, and this created a, uh, a moment in Chinese literary culture that was incredibly rich, incredibly dynamic. Figures like uh, Li Bo, 
uh, Du Fu, Meng Hao Ran, uh, names that any Chinese uh, school child today can still uh, uh, call up and, and recite uh, their poems from memory. Uh, these were individuals who were, who were the giants of, of poetry and remain uh, uh, they, they, they are still looked back upon uh, by later Chinese as, uh, as, as cultural paragons. And, and they all lived uh, during the reign of, uh, of Xuanzong. Now, Xuanzong, for most of his reign, was uh, a pretty active emperor. He was pretty much a hands-on kind of emperor. He was engaged, he was involved in the, the day-to-day activities at court. He he managed the affairs of state, he managed the empire uh, in some pretty good, pretty competent ways. But as time went by, as he got to be older, um, he became more concerned uh, with perhaps the, the inner life of, uh, of the palace uh, in two ways. One was that he became concerned with the quest for immortality. Uh, in China, during this time, uh, particularly during the northern and southern dynasties, but, but carrying on down into later times, um, a, a, a spiritual practice that we call religious Taoism, to distinguish it from the philosophical Taoism we've talked about earlier, developed, that was very concerned with seeking out uh, immortality, seeking to be in communication with a spiritual realm which was populated with immortal beings. And part of the way that this was done was through taking various uh, chemical substances into one's body, uh, producing heightened states of spiritual uh, sensitivity, if you will. Uh, or maybe it was simply a matter of uh, taking hallucinogens. But however you may interpret it, uh, it worked for the people involved. And they believed that they were having encounters with these immortals, with these spiritual beings. And the spiritual beings would communicate to them various techniques, various recipes, if you will, for better and better concoctions which would help you to pursue your spiritual quest. Well, Xuanzong becomes interested in immortality as he gets older, a not surprising uh, development, and he uh, gets somewhat involved in these kinds of activities. More significantly, uh, at least as things play out historically, he becomes very enamored of one of his uh, consorts. And this is a gal uh, known as Yang Guifei. Uh, she's from uh, the Yang family. Uh, Guifei is not a personal name, it's a, it's a title. It means precious concubine or precious consort. So Yang Guifei um, is chosen, is, is selected out by Xuanzong uh, from uh, the ranks of the court women, and she becomes his favorite. She becomes his fairly constant companion. And indeed, she comes to play a role in his life uh, beyond that of simply uh, a, a palace lady. She becomes a, a partner. She becomes an advisor in some ways to him. Uh, she shares in discussions with him about the affairs of state and about his other concerns. And this makes her a very powerful uh, individual. Indeed, it makes her such a powerful individual, or at least such a potentially powerful individual, that it excites the jealousy of Confucian officials, of the regular officials uh, at the court. And this, as we will see in a few moments, uh, can become a very problematic thing. In the Tang Dynasty, one important political concern is frontier security, uh, maintaining the uh, defenses along China's border with Inner Asia. The Tang Dynasty comes up with some very interesting strategies to deal with this problem. They continue the policies inherited from the Sui of establishing agricultural colonies, military colonies out along the frontier, but they also come up with some new policies, some new techniques, and one of these is to employ military forces from one part of the frontier in the defense of another part of the frontier. And a very concrete example of this is the use of Uyghurs, of Turkic peoples, from Central Asia on the defense of the northeastern frontier of China, uh, where the people uh, against whom they were defending were not Turks, but were uh, other uh, non-Chinese uh, uh, um, ethnicities. One individual 
uh, a, a Uyghur Turk who was so employed by the Tang was a man called An Lushan. An Lushan is his uh, name in the Chinese records. His Turkic name uh, seems to have been something like Rakshan, uh, but that becomes An Lushan in, uh, uh, in Chinese. And he was in charge of a Chinese garrison uh, near where the modern-day city of Beijing is located. Well, he was a very successful uh, military leader. He was a very competent general. He defended his uh, part of the frontier quite uh, uh, effectively. And he became something of a popular figure at Xuanzong's court. And indeed, he was a favorite of the emperor himself. Uh, Every so often, uh, uh, these uh, commanders would uh, come to the capital and make a report to the emperor. And when those uh, occasions took place, when An Lushan was involved, he was received quite warmly. He was entertained personally by the emperor uh, and got to know him. Uh, they got to be uh, very good uh, associates. Um, I don't know if ever, anybody ever really establishes a close friendship with the emperor like that, but uh, they, they came to have a relationship of trust. Well, An Lushan also uh, came to be uh, good friends uh, with uh, Yang Guifei. Um, this was entirely appropriate in context, and indeed in their correspondence, which is preserved in the historical records, he refers to her as, he uses the term mother when he writes to her and addresses her, which would be appropriate since she was the consort of the emperor whom he would have addressed uh, as if he were his father. Uh, so uh, the relationship as it's recorded in their correspondence appears to have been uh, perfectly uh, ordinary, but jealous officials at the court chose to slander both Yang Guifei and An Lushan uh, by claiming that they were having an illicit sexual relationship. Uh, the emperor didn't believe this, uh, but he was uh, uh, so persistently uh, uh, fed these rumors that eventually uh, he uh, began to perhaps have his doubts. And it may be that his uh, state of mind was somewhat affected by the chemicals that he'd been taking in his pursuit of Taoist immortality. At any rate, he comes to at least have suspicions, and he summons An Lushan to come to the capital. And An Lushan, who is not unaware of the slanders that are circulating at court, um, resists this, he doesn't want to do this, he doesn't want to come to the capital and and deal with this. Uh, This is taken by his enemies at court as evidence of his perfidy, uh, and the emperor uh, asks him again to come, and An Lushan finally decides that he has to do this, and he leaves to go to court, but he takes his army with him. And this triggers, in the year 755, uh, what we call the An Lushan Rebellion. And the An Lushan Rebellion becomes uh, the great dividing line in the history of the Tang Dynasty. Uh, from its founding uh, around 617 up until 755, uh, the Tang has been a, a great success story. But with the outbreak of the An Lushan Rebellion, the dynasty is shaken to its very foundations. The rebellion lasts from 755 to 763, Uh, so it takes eight years for this situation to play itself out and be dealt with. When An Lushan leads his forces south, uh, a number of battles take place, a number of uh, sieges, uh, uh, and in every encounter he uh, emerges victorious, his forces grow, uh, and it appears that this may be uh, the end of the Tang Dynasty. As he approaches the capital at Chang'an, Uh, the emperor and the courtiers decide uh, not to stay in the palace and receive An Lushan, even though he has been summoned by the emperor, uh, but they run away. They flee the capital, they go off over the mountains to the southwest, down into Sichuan. And in the course of their flight, uh, poor Yang Guifei meets her sad fate. Uh, Finally, the emperor has been, uh, if not convinced of her betrayal, Uh, At least he realizes that he can no longer sustain his relationship with her in the face of opposition, and he allows her to be taken away from him, and she is strangled and left, her body left by the roadside as the imperial uh, entourage moves on. The emperor dies the next year. An Lushan himself dies in the course of the rebellion. Uh, A new emperor and An's son continue to fight things out for a few more years until finally, in 763, the stability of the Tang uh, is restored. Unfortunately, certain compromises, certain deals have had to be cut 
Uh, the court has had to surrender, for example, the control of revenues from certain parts of the empire to win the loyalty of military commanders. So although the dynasty is restored, it never fully regains the wealth and power, uh, the dynamism uh, that it had possessed in its first half. It will continue for another 150 years, uh, but never really quite with the power and glory of the first half of the dynasty. We'll take up the story of the second half of the Tang in the next lecture.